let's get into what happened to you because your story is very unique. Um, looking through and knowing a lot of the different teams and the, di the dynamics, having veterans on staff and strength departments, not, not unique, but how you got there is a very unique story. Can you kind of walk us through how you ended up getting out of the army? So in 2012, on uh, my uh, second deployment to Afghanistan, uh, both of my deployments were in Kandahar. And on uh, this deployment was a little rougher in 2012. Uh, we were on a dismounted patrol. Uh, I was in the back. I was uh, the weapon squad leader. They called me on the radio and, you know, told me that we saw they saw guys up on a rooftop nearby to bring the gun to the front so we could pull uh, security and put in a support by fire with the gun. And, um, you know, making my way through the path that had already been cleared, everybody, you know, I wasn't, like I said, I was in the back, so I wasn't expecting anything. And then I stepped on a pressure plate, um, bomb went off, uh, you know, I tasted chemicals. I saw, you know, I couldn't see anything at first, but I could hear everybody yell my name. I looked down and saw my leg, um, you know, blood all over my leg and I'm in a crater and I, and I, my first thought was to get out of the crater and push myself out of it because I didn't know if there was something else inside there, if that was just a small explosive and something bigger was underneath it. So I was trying to get out of it. And by that time, the medic came by, put the tourniquet on. Um, we were in between two wadis. Uh, two so what's kind, of, what's kind of going on? Because I think that's the, the – we hear these war stories all the time about what happens. What's going through your head whenever you're, you're watching your, your corpsman, your medic, put the tourniquet on your on your leg what's going through your head at that time i was like man this shit this this really hurts <laughs> <laughs> yeah but, uh, it, it's funny because like the initial shock it hurt but then i was also worried about you know you're on a patrol it's not like you're out you know out and about it, it, just walking down the street and it's, not like it's not over it's not over so like your first instinct is wow i get you know now I'm hurt. Now I'm down. Um, I'm the squad leader. So right. I'm like, I got to make sure my guys are good as well. But <laughs> how can I do that while I'm sitting on a litter with a tourniquet on my leg? So that was my initial thought was, man, I, um, but I, I remember just calling out commands while strapped to a litter and people were like, shut up. Like you don't <laughs> even see what's going on right now. Yeah. But you but can't give that up. Like one, like when yeah. you're in charge or you have that leadership position, giving that up in the moment, because I'm sure you felt kind of like how, like I did, where you know something bad could happen. So you want to take charge even more. Like, hey, guys, we got to do this right now. Like this isn't, right. not, things are about to get serious. Oh, yeah. Man, man. So you end up going back. You're sitting on the litter. Then what happens? So – that path we were on was between two um, uh, streams or rivers, whatever you want to call it. Uh, you know, we call them wadis, uh, or, th or they call them that over there. And then, uh, so we had to get to the other side of one of those so the helicopter could land. Um, the path that we were on was too small for it to land. And so they, they walked me across the uh, river, and I just remember yelling at the four guys that were carrying me, and I said, if you drop me in this nasty water, <laughs> I, was like, I kept looking down to the water it, was, it just looked disgusting but so they they get me to the other side and then um they decided they were going to splint my leg after we got across because I remember holding my uh foot that was still attached but it was you know was messed up pretty bad and I was sitting there holding that leg with my good leg uh, across the river and then they were like, oh, we got to splint it and then they started putting the IV on waiting for the helicopter or the medevac to come in and uh and are so, you guys taking fire or anything like this while this is not happening? yet nothing's happening at this point so um you know they get the splint on they get the IV in and i hear the medevac coming in and uh at that time as soon as the medevac landed the guys that were up on that roof opened up uh with a pkm on the medevac and uh and so the medevac picked up and left because they were in between us and the guys on the roof. So they had to get out of that, that area. And so now after the medevac picks up and takes off, um, now the guys that brought me over uh, across the river are now in a firefight with the guys on the rooftop. 
So they, you know, it was maybe five to 10 minutes passed and uh, another helicopter came in and did a, a gun run on the building. And then, uh, you know, so after they did a couple gun runs, they, uh, other, me the medevac came back in and landed and picked me up. And I'm sure that was over the course of how long you think, 30 minutes or so? Uh, from the explosion or yeah, from... Yeah, until you got actually on the helicopter. About 30, yeah, 20 to 30 minutes. But I bet it felt like fucking years, man. Years. <laughs> <laughs> it was just insane, though, like, because, like I said, I was strapped to litter, so I can't see what's going on. I'm calling out, uh, you know, commands to the gun team, and they're like, thank God we didn't listen to your dumbass, because you... <laughs> They're trying to get the medic to give you morphine just so you shut up. <laughs> yeah. So, no, yeah. Well, our medics didn't even carry morphine. Uh, they gave me like a pill pack, but it was more or less for, and you know, to help fight infections. Uh, yeah. To, and that was it. Like our medics weren't even allowed to carry morphine. So how long until after you, you, I assume you end up going to the hospital and spending quite a bit of time. How long were you in the hospital? Um, so I was at Walter Reed for um, 15 to 17 months, I want to say. And it was, uh, you know, most of that time, though, was just waiting on the Army to medically discharge me. So within six months, I had, I was already doing Tough mutters and, like, everything else. So my rehab was pretty good. So um, while I was there, I was able to help uh, – the PTs that were there and, and kind of shadow them. And, uh, cause it, I, I felt like that's what I wanted to do was help people when I got out. And so I was able to work alongside some of the physical therapists at Walter Reed. Was that a difficult, was that a difficult thing for you? Because I assume if you're a Sergeant and squad leader that you're on your second enlistment at that time, was it a difficult thing for you to be like, this is where you don't choose whenever your army career is over. Right. That, and that's what I tell people. That's the hardest thing. Um, I reenlisted the month before I was blown up. So, you know, I, I had planned on doing 20 and mm -hmm. I was at six at the time. And so I just reenlisted for another six. And, um, and that, like I tried to tell some of like some of the players asked me about it and I said that would be like you you know, you love playing football and all of a sudden you go down and that's it. Like you don't have a chance like it's uh Ryan Shazier situation where yeah. you know, you get injured and you're done, but you weren't done mentally, like you like you wanted to be out there and and, the, and the, laying in the hospital bed was the hardest part was like here I am a squad leader and now I don't know who's taking on my squad. I don't know what's going on with these guys. Like I treated those guys like my brothers, you yeah. know, and, and really try to do my best and look out for them while I was. And there's certain, for. and there's certain aspects about being a military man or military lady that that becomes your entire identity. Like there's right. a huge part of who you are as a person, what you identify as comes from your job, just like an NFL player would. So when you kind of had that stripped away, it's tough for a lot of guys. Did you go through that transition of I'm getting out? What could possibly be next for me that's as fulfilling as what I'm doing now? Yeah, I, I, I know when I first got home, like when I first got out of the hospital, everything was good. And, you know, I was enjoying spending time with family going, you know, I, I had the freedom to do whatever I was. Uh, get retirement pay for the rest of your life. Right. <laughs> I, I, getting retired pay. but just something was missing and and I had like you said you you lose that identity and now you've like I felt like like what's my purpose like what like what am I going to do for the rest of my life now like I don't have any clue of what I want to do and and so that to me that was the hardest thing not having that identity anymore and did you stumble in speaking of not knowing what to do did you stumble into this Jaguars internship um, so I got involved with uh wounded warrior project because they're based out of Jackson, right. you know, they have the headquarters here in Jacksonville. So, mm -hmm. um, they used to have a program called the track program where you do two semesters of college. And then the last four months of the program, you go um, do an internship in a local business in Jacksonville. And, uh, so I found out one of the other 
people that was in track, um, Andrew Coughlin, he now works for Wounded Warrior Project. Um, he, you know, he told me that he did an internship with the Jags and that's basically how I even found out that, you know, that I would be able to do it. And so in 14, I did an internship, but it was more like office, um, like I was bouncing around all of, in the office and, and then I wound up with uh, helping the athletic trainers and the uh, strength staff at the, towards the end. And the head strength coach said, hey, if you decide that you're going to go to school for, um, you know, sports science or sports medicine, let me know and we'll bring you back on as a full-time intern for the whole season. So that's what happened in 2017. I came Not a back. bad year to be there, going to the AFC Championship oh, game. Man. Yeah, that was that was awesome. I bet. Uh, so then you then you go out and at the end of the season, I saw on a documentary that they did about you where you meet up with Tom Coughlin and he ends up offering you a full time job. Were you kind of overwhelmed at that point? Like this is going to be my life. This is going to be what I'm going to do. It's not just a season. Yeah, yeah. I mean, do I? So the AFC Championship. I was an intern. We had two. Uh, my position and then another internship which we kind of set aside for um, guys that are in limbo like don't have a um, you know may have gotten let go and are trying to find another job and so that that in turn um, wound up going to the AFC championship and someone uh, a friend of mine uh, found out his name's Mark Lowry found out that I wasn't able to go and decided to you know, um, so the Jags had this uh, plane deal where they, they take you in the plane and put you in a, a hotel and everything. And then you go to the game and you're in the suite. So I actually went with um, that group oh, nice. to the AFC championship. And then so after the game, like I didn't see any of the players during that day or anything like that. I, I was basically a fan at that point. And uh, so – after the game, I remember texting, uh, like, all the strength staff. You know, it's like, you know, I'm very emotional. I would thank you for everything you guys did. Um, um, you know, I learned a lot from you guys, and, and thank you for um, bringing me in and allowing me to be there. And uh, so the next day I came in, I, you know, I came in to clean out my locker, and um, I ran into Dave Caldwell in the hallway. And for those that aren't big Jags fans, Dave Caldwell is the general manager. Right. And so talking to the general manager, Dave Caldwell, he, you know, I said, um, you know, thank you for everything. And and he could tell I was getting emotional because that's like, I thought I was done. Like this is over. And then uh, he goes, before you get all emotional on me, um, I want you to go. I think coach Coughlin wants you to talk to him in his office. So I went over there to coach Coughlin's office and uh it's probably which is like probably going to see the base general whenever you're like a specialist or something like that you got to go see the general fuck (laughs) (laughs) what did I do what did I do I think it in my head and so as I go into his office uh Dave Caldwell was right behind me and I didn't even know it and uh Dave Caldwell shuts the door um as I go in and uh, they both look at me and they say, hey, um, we think you would be an asset to this team. We, um, you know, have watched you all year and, you know, like what we see. Um, do you think you will, um, you know, be an asset to the team? And I said, yeah, I'm going to do it all I can. I mean, I'll, I'll do whatever I need to. So it, it was it was just amazing that they gave me that opportunity. Now, I know – I. Whenever I got hired at Barstool, I always felt like there was going to be an element of people who thought, oh, he just got hired because he's a veteran. He's going to do the veteran podcast. Going into a a job like being in the strength staff of an NFL team, do you take that and you're like, I'm going to have to work my ass off even harder so people know that this job wasn't just handed to me. I'm going to prove that I fucking belong here too. Yeah, I think a lot. I mean, not only – do I think that people have that perception, but I also had a perception myself, like, okay, you know, all the, you know, there's people all across the country that are out there fighting to try to get on a team or in, in football in general. And, and so, 
you know, they put their time in for different internships, you know, years and, and were able to get to that spot. So I know I was very fortunate and, and, you know, it could have, you know, gave me a, a, you know, the upper hand, but Hey, I'll take it. <laughs> yeah. get it. But now it's yeah. just basically just, you know, doing all I can to um, solidify that and just make myself um, a better strength coach. You know, the, right now I'm doing my master's. And, and you looked a lot more yoked up than you did in the 2017 video. You're in the weight I'm room trying. yourself. I can tell. My God, dude, you've probably put on, what, 40 pounds of muscle in like the last two years? <laughs> uh, uh, I don't know if it's 40 pounds, but. Yeah, a lot. You look a lot bigger than you did in 2017. 